The theme that we've taken for our service, you've seen it kind of go through as we've gone, and I want to pick up just for the next 15 minutes or so, is this theme of the living hope that we have in Jesus, which might be news to some people. You might never have heard about that before, and for some of us who've been Christians for yonks, this is a kind of refresher, as it were, of stuff that we have heard Easter upon Easter upon Easter. But the amazing thing is this story never gets tired, because come on, it never, it never gets tired because there's further that we can go in all of our lives. When I was praying this morning, uh, I uh, came across a verse in Matthew chapter 28, verse 9 in, in the New Testament. It tells the story of that first Easter morning. And as it happens sometimes, a little phrase jumped out as I was reading it again. I've read it many, many times before, but uh, out of the phrase, out of the passage came the phrase, uh, Jesus suddenly came to them. Uh, and that was the risen Jesus. And I thought, that was, that was awesome. What a prayer for you. And that's what I was praying for you and for me this morning, that we'd have a great time here, and we'll get some really good coffee coming in a minute or two, but an Easter egg and all of that. So you just, if, if this is a struggle, you can just think sugar and caffeine are on their way. Okay, uh, yeah, we're, we're getting that. But more than that, I'm praying for me and for you that Jesus will suddenly come close to you. Yes. And that uh, you know, there's some kind of abstract idea that it's been for some of you for a long time will become a real live experience even this morning. Now, on this theme of living hope, let me start with a definition of the word hope. Uh, uh, I'll test you on this over coffee. Okay, so here's one definition of the word hope. It's an optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes. Easy. Okay. I don't know where you are on the optimistic scale, right? Uh, you know, there's optimists on one end and there's pessimists on the other. I wonder where you'd place yourself. Well, there was a, there was a guy who had two sons, uh, twins. They were identical twins. They looked exactly the same. But there was one massive difference between them. One of them had been born incredibly optimistic. Right? He just saw the good in everything. And the other one, same age, looked exactly the same, everything. But he was incredibly pessimistic. It didn't matter what went on in life, he was pessimistic about it. So anyway, one birthday, I think it was about the 10th birthday, the dad decides, I'm going to do a wee bit of a test here. Uh, you, know, you shouldn't really experiment on your children. But anyway, he decided to. So he said, I know what we'll do. For the pessimistic child, he bought, they bought tons of brilliant presents. All the things, as you can imagine, that a 10-year-old would want. Piled his room high with all these things and said, happy birthday, little boy. And in the other room, where the optimist boy had his own bedroom, uh, they thought, I don't know what I'll do, I'll test him. He filled his room with horse manure. Okay, and I know you're, just, you're shocked. Church, Sunday, horse manure. <laughs> anyway, just give me a minute, okay? Uh, horse manure, piled it high, high and high and high in the room. Anyway, later on in the evening, his dad's walking past, and he hears all this crying, sobbing, and all the rest of it. Coming out of the boy's room had got all the presents, that little pessimistic boy. So he goes in and says, what's up, son? He said, look, all these presents, I've got every present you could ever want. All the kids at school are going to be really jealous of me now. And look at all this pile of instructions I've got to read for all these toys. And I'm going to be chasing after batteries all the time, trying to put batteries in these toys if I'm ever going to use them. 
whoa, whoa, whoa. Anyway, Dad said, well, I don't know what to do about that. Anyway, Dad's walking down the corridor, and he hears out of the other boys' room laughter and dancing and music and joy. He said, what is going on? Opens the room, and a massive big pile of horse manure that's there, the wee boy, he's dancing on top of it. He's doing a jig, and he's jumping up and down. And he said, what? What's, what's with you? Dancing on this big pile of horse manure. He said, well, with all this horse manure in here, there's bound to be a pony somewhere. <laughs> so I don't know where you are on the optimistic through to the pessimistic scale. And we're all different kind of people. We all have, we'll have our moments. But what I want to say is that this message of living hope is for you, wherever you are on that spectrum. Because it's actually nothing to do with us and our optimism or our pessimism. It's to do with the fact that the living God has resurrected and brings life to us. And that's what I want to unpack just for a few minutes together. Uh, the kind of hope that we are talking about is not superficial. Uh, Leslie Newbigin, a bishop, uh, put it succinctly, and he described hope this way. The great news this Easter is that the living hope that we are talking about is not the vague hope so of our culture, but it's a certain sure hope based on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Amazing, isn't it? You see, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Yeah. It is a pivotal point in the story of Jesus, but it's also a pivotal point in the whole of human history. For those of you who don't know the story, Heather outlined a little bit of it earlier. Uh, Jesus comes onto earth, God made man. He lives for three years as an, well, he, he goes, he's lived for 30 years, but uh, he comes and ministers and does miracles and teaching and so on for three years. And then he surrenders himself to the most awful death, which is what we were remembering on Good Friday, where he's crucified on the cross. He surrendered his life. It's a horrendous death. And you could be forgiven as they were then for thinking, well, that's the end of Christianity before it even starts. All of our hopes had been on this man, on this Jesus, the symbol of whom is the cross. And we even have the cross here in the room. You could have been thinking, well, Christianity is dead and buried before it's even started. But what we know now, historically speaking, is that when they came to the tomb on the Easter Sunday morning, well, we call it that, but the, the first day of the week, the, the Sunday following that Friday, they found that not only was the tomb empty, but that Jesus was present. You see, if it was just the tomb was empty, somebody could have nicked the body and all of that, that could all have been taken. But Jesus was actually present, alive. And over the next 40 days, more than 500 people met Jesus, either individually or in crowds. If you're you know, if you haven't considered this and you're thinking, well, that seems a bit far-fetched, that whole thing, can I recommend a book to you? There's a wonderful book called uh, The Case, I've forgotten it, <laughs> The Case for Easter by a guy called Lee Strobel. It's, it's quite a short book. You can get it uh, on bookstores and so on uh, and online. Uh, get yourself that. And he, he's a journalist and he goes through all the logic and the reasons for believing uh, the fact that Jesus was dead and is now uh, alive and, uh, and is risen. I haven't got time to go into all those things now, but I can recommend that book to you. You see, but my point here is that the resurrection was the central moment in the life of Jesus, but it's also the central moment in human history because the, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, and we were singing this earlier, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that works to transform our lives in 2022. It's, it's awesome. It's awesome. How does that happen? Well, it happens because the very Jesus that we've been worshiping is present now with us, his people. And this is something that we all need, this living hope. Of course, it is a, a hope to live by. When we think of the world, we think, well, there's plenty of scope right now for some places where there's some hope required. When we think of our nation of Scotland, we think there are plenty of places right now that need a living hope, not just a get through today and get through the night and get through to tomorrow kind of hope. We need a living hope. And maybe even in your life and in mine, right now, this very moment, we identify the fact that there are things in our life for which we need this living hope. Maybe we need uh, fresh hope in our relationships or our finances, our careers, our future any number of things. And so what I want to just say in a few moments is that the resurrection of Jesus brings hope to us on different levels. It brings hope 
for the past being dealt with, it brings hope for our future, and it brings hope for our present. And very briefly, I'd like to go through that. Now, it's not just my made-up ideas, this you'll be pleased to know. Uh, I'm basing what I want to share with you on the words of a man called Peter, who was an apostle of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. He was present all the way through all of the events of Easter, uh, met the living Jesus, saw him ascend into heaven, and then about maybe 25, 30 years later or so, he wrote down, as he came towards the end of his life, he was writing down the meaning of that resurrection for the people then, and it translates into our life now. And we find it in the Christian's Bible. He wrote uh, two letters. The first is called the first letter from Peter, and it's written to you. And this is one of the verses that it says. Let, let me read it to you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope, there's that phrase, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, and fade. That inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power. And you can see I took the liberty of just uh, emphasizing the past, the future, and the present the power of the resurrection. Three effects for us. So, number one then, we receive the promise, this tells us, of a new start that deals with our past. Now, God in His great mercy has given us a new birth. That's the picture He uses there, a, a new birth. I don't know if you've ever held a newborn baby, if you ever had that privilege, whether you be an auntie or a friend or you just happen to be in a cafe someday and somebody's told this baby. Um, uh, I've had the privilege of being at the birth of my three children, and then shortly after the birth of my three grandchildren, I keep having to think of it because another one due, uh, but uh, three grandchildren, having the joy of being able to hold them as a baby. Now, I appreciate that's a tremendous privilege that Heather and I have had that not everybody gets, but that's a privilege that we have had to be able to hold a baby. Now, I tell you, when a mum entrusts a newborn baby to you, you don't tend to hold it out like that, do you? You know, unless it's particularly smelly, but you know, uh, you, you don't tend to hold it out like there. Every time I've seen this, and you might recall it, when someone gives you a baby to hold, the immediate thing you do, don't you? Come on, am I the only one that loves on babies here? Okay, you're a hard lot, aren't you? You hold a baby at arm's length with a pair of them litter picker things. Hold it. Uh, when anybody gives me a baby, the first thing I do is I just want to cradle the baby and, and hold the baby close for the baby's safety and security. But there's, there's an, um, if you haven't had this experience, maybe it will come someday. It's an amazing experience to hold a newborn baby, complete vulnerability, and yet there's a relational thing starts to happen there. Now, when uh, Peter is using the description of the new birth for our new life, he's been really careful, hasn't he, to be able to do that because it's a transformational relationship. When we say yes to Jesus, when we have this new birth in him, we uh, become a child of God and he becomes our loving heavenly father. And so in the same way as me as a, as a dad or a grandfather or a friend or somebody who's walking past holds the baby close to me, he holds us in that kind of embrace. And this is news to lots of people. Lots of people think God is far away, God is a judge, and God is all of this, but God wants to hold you close and pull you close. That's why this phrase here is the new birth. It's awesome. You see, that new birth, is, it's not something that happens physically, obviously, to us, but it's something that most definitely happens to us spiritually. Our old person uh, is left behind, and a new person is born. Let me illustrate this for you, if I may. I have a wee t-shirt here. And I think if you imagine that this t-shirt represents our life before Jesus gives us a new life, some of the things that are in our life, and again, this was, this was my story, but it, it also applies to, to other folk. You might have guilt for things in the past that you wish hadn't happened. You may have regret about some stuff. There may be a sense of failure, uh, even sin, if you want to use that, a sense of shame about something, mistakes that have been made in the past. You know, these kind of things are the things that are not written on us, but that are, you know, you know what I mean, don't you? They're in us. They're, they're things that we wrestle with from time to time just because we're human beings. Now, I could take this um, T-shirt, of course, and I could put it in my washing machine, and it would give it a good wash, uh, a good temperature, and uh, I'm pretty confident 
that those black stains wouldn't wash out because they're written with indelible marker. It may take some of them out, but forever, if I ever went to wear this T-shirt, it would always be the T-shirt that had the black marks on it, wouldn't it? There's nothing I can do to make that the T-shirt that hasn't got the black marks anymore. But what happens in the resurrection of Jesus is two things in this new birth. He takes our past, all of these shameful, sinful regrets and guilt that we carry, and, and wipes them out. But it's not that he washes them away, as it were. It's that he gives us a whole brand new life. So it's not worthy to hold up the same t-shirt. It's a completely different life. The Bible tells us when anyone becomes a Christian, they become a brand new person inside. The old is gone and the new has come and all this is done by God. So this is the new life represented, obviously, that we have in Jesus. That's the promise of the resurrection. For those of us who most of us who want to leave that stuff behind, we want rid of it. We don't want it just to keep washing it and bringing it back round and round and round again. We want a new life and we want a new direction. And that is what Jesus promises us. It's amazing. It's a wonderful, wonderful truth that deals with the past. Now, and the second thing that this, uh, uh, the resurrection deals with is it deals with our future. And we are promised, you heard it as I read it earlier, a great inheritance a great inheritance. Now, our resurrection life, our new birth, is not just for this world, but it's also for the eternity, the the time going on and on. Now, I don't know what your view of death is, whether you think, you know, or life after death, is there anything beyond there or not? We all get different views, I'm I'm sure. We did a poll. Um, But one of the things that is clear is that when Peter was writing that letter about the inheritance that we have in the future, he was writing it into a culture that did not believe that there was life after death. Uh, A typical gravestone had this kind of typical message on it. You can see here, uh, this is taken from a gravestone. I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. Happy Easter. Okay, that's what you came. That is the, it's just like dead, isn't it? That was very typically the stuff that was on the gravestones when Peter was writing. So when Peter is writing and saying, this is a promise of eternity, it's wonderful. It's, uh, you know, we have that phrase, we, we are born into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade that's kept in heaven for us. Now, again, let me illustrate this. I I like illustrations and little things you can use. Here's a wee piece of string here, and this represents our life on earth. Let's say I'm going to cut you some slack and say that you're going to live to 120, okay? Uh, Then that, uh, anyway, in the first service, there was somebody older than a piece of string, so uh, (laughs) I ran into a bit of uh, psychological trouble there, so I'm going to cut you 120. If there's anybody here over than 120, I'll see you afterwards, and I'll... (laughs) I'll get you a coffee. But let's say this represents all of our life. You know, you see there's a knot in the middle because that represents the midlife crisis. Okay, that, that's where your motorbikes and your sports cars and your redecorating your front room every year for 10 years it comes from because that's the kind of lives that we lead. And of course, we could tie different knots in here. Uh, if we got married, there's a knot there. If we have children, there's knots there. Uh, there's all those sorts of things. And throughout our life, we're thinking, I don't know about you, but you're thinking about what's going on in your life. And inevitably, they tell me that as you get older, you start thinking about the end of this piece of string and how far away is it. Uh, Obviously, for you, it's another 60 years away right now. But you get that kind of idea. But the fact is, if all of our life is only for the length of this even 120 years, it's not enough, is it? It's, It's not security. But what is promised through the resurrection of Jesus, you heard it there, is that we have an inheritance, and it's represented by this ball of string. This this future comes with our present, and I'm just going to agree not there, when we connect with the resurrection of Jesus. So there's our 120 years, and then we have ongoing, 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 ongoing. In fact, I could even, if I can undo that, no. I could go on and unravel and unravel and unravel. There's 50 meters of rope in here. I don't know how many years that represents, if that meter represented. Do you know, so you get the thing. This is the eternal life that Christ has promised us. And he can only promise it because he can deliver it. And he can only deliver it because he was dead and now he lives. Because he lives, we have the promise 
of an eternity with him. It promises us a future that we could never have imagined even on our own. So we have freedom from sin and suffering and so on. That's coming. In the book of Revelation, it says, in the new earth and eternity, it's not going to be like the life we have now. It's a new life where sin and uh, pain and suffering are gone and we are at one with Jesus. Amazing. Jesus promised it. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. This living hope offers us a new and glorious inheritance. And then finally, we have the bit in between, the now. Okay, 2020, this is where we're at. We've got our past dealt with if we accept Jesus. We've got our future secured if we trust Jesus. And now here we are in our present. Recently, I I saw a poll uh, in which people were asked, uh, who do you turn to when you need help? Uh, And the kind of answers were, well, I asked my mom. Some say I asked my friend. A few said I asked my dad, but I never do what he says anyway, but I do ask him for advice. Uh, More people said, um, and it's pretty harsh on the dads, but that's true. Um, uh, They ask Google or they ask Alexa. Okay, now we got an Alexa at Christmas, last Christmas, and it's great for some things. What's the weather going to be like? This, that, next thing. It'll tell you. But if I say, how am I going to feel tomorrow? Right, it'll, it'll probably say, I cannot compute. I do not know the answer for that. Here is something I read online. Right, it'll be nothing to do with it because Alexa doesn't know me. Google doesn't know you. And so if you're going to have any influence in your life today, you want it to be someone that you're in relationship with. And that's what Jesus promises in his resurrection. You see, um, the, the phrase said that we are shielded by God's power. We have a relationship with an all-powerful God. Can you imagine what it feels like, just imagine it right now, to be shielded by God's power? That changes everything in 2022. This is what I pray for the dear folk of Ukraine. When you're thinking, what are you going to pray for Ukraine? Lord, would you shield them with your power? That is some power. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that shields them. When I pray for those in the congregation who have got stuff going on in their life that is just a handful, let's put it that way, I say, Lord, would you shield them with your power? Because your power is greater than anything that can come to them, even death, because yours is the power of the raised Jesus from the dead and lives in us to do. You see, this is God's speciality, helping out in really difficult circumstances. We could take time and look through the Bible. You can read it in your, yourself. You see that God made ways through seas, God took um, uh, a valley covered in dry bones and he spoke his words and those bones came together into an army of people who helped God's people. There's all these miraculous stories, tons of them in the Bible, which, but the point of them is to show that God, the God that I'm speaking about, has got the power to be with you as a companion in the life that you lead today. Amen. So whatever you're facing today, you have a companion. Whatever you'll face tomorrow, and we don't know what we're facing tomorrow, let's not worry about tomorrow. Jesus said, today's got enough troubles of its own. But even as you go through today, whatever's coming your way, whatever's happening to you right now, whatever is predominant in your mind and your heart right now, Jesus is your companion. The risen Jesus wants to walk with you. Easter brings with it the offer of a living hope. Jesus is alive, and so he can promise this. This means our past is dealt with, it means our future is secured, and it means in the present, we have a present helper, a companion who travels with us. Now, that is something worth celebrating, isn't it, this Easter day? And I pray that that will be an encouragement to you as it's been to me. This living hope is available for every one of us, but it requires us to do something. For me, it was way back in prehistory, 1978, when I was a young teenager. Uh, I, I went to church for one of the first times on Good Friday morning. I, I Honestly, I'll tell you, I went home. I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. It was just, honestly, it was just gobbledygook. I just had no, I, I couldn't even compute it. But when I got home, I was intrigued by it, so much so that I remembered that a few years before that, I had been given one of those little red Gideon's Bibles that used to be given out in schools. Uh, so I went rooting around in the cupboard, and after about half an hour, I found it in the very bottom of the cupboard. I hadn't opened it since I was given it in first year at secondary school. I flicked through to Luke's Gospel, 
uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke and started to read the, the back end of that about what Jesus had, you know, the whole journey of Jesus up to the cross and beyond. And man, something, you know, that Jesus suddenly surprised him. In that moment, upstairs in my bedroom, I, I, I don't know what it is, I felt or I sensed the very presence of Jesus in the room. And I just felt, and I said, well, I'm, I can't understand any of this, but if this is true, if this is true, Jesus, you'll have the rest of my life, I'll surrender it to you, to you and do what you want to do. And that was a transformational moment in my life. I was about 15 or 16. I just think I've got no idea where I'd be right now. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I've got no idea. But what I do know is that having said that, then I, I, I went through life then with a companion. And so that was so special to me. I want it to be special for you. There'll be people here this morning, I'm absolutely sure of it, or watching online, you know, that uh, all of this just feels like gobbledygook to you. You think, what is all of that about? But you're not here by accident. You're not hearing me by accident. This God, uh, the resurrected Jesus, loves you and wants to be in close relationship with you. And so I want to give opportunity for us all to respond. There'll be folks here, uh, in the sound of my voice, who, yeah, I, you know, I, was, I would say I was a Christian because years ago I had some kind of commitment. But to be honest, it's just kind of frittered away. It's just I haven't given any attention in the last however many years. Well, today is a kind of reset button opportunity for you. And for those of us who do love and serve Jesus, can you believe for yourself that there's more? That the more that you surrender to Jesus, the more he will be with you and encourage you and challenge you and help you. And so I'd like to say a prayer in fact, we're, we're all going to pray the prayer, but you just have a, a look at it for a second or two. Just acquaint yourself with the words. And I'm going to encourage the whole congregation, just so that none of us are embarrassed about it. We'll all say it together. For some of us, it will just be words. That's cool. For others, this will be really significant. Yeah. And, you know, and just allow it to be significant for you if that's the case. So I'll just give you a second just to have a read at it. And then we'll read the prayer together. So if everybody reads it, then uh, we'll all read together. So let's begin, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me and for coming back from the dead. Today, I want to receive the living hope you offer me. Please forgive me for all the wrong things I have done and give me a new start. Come into my life and grant me help for today and hope for tomorrow. In your name, amen. Amen.